I want to talk to you about worldview. Um, let me just ask a question as we get going today. What is your worldview? What do you really believe? So um, today, I'll be answering four questions that have to be answered for you to have a godly worldview. How I many you know Christianity passes the test? It answers all those questions. So we're going to take a look at that. Are y'all alive in this place? All right. Y'all like prayer? <laughs> um, how many of you felt the presence of God in here? All right. So that is wonderful. We um, did what the church is supposed to do. If we've experienced God's presence, because church is all about him. It's not about me. I'm just telling you right now, um, I do my best to communicate, but I'm a human being. And um, if you don't get God when you come here, you're going to be very disappointed when you leave. So it's all about getting connected to God. Um, how many of you will start, as, as I start to really encourage us to start praying more, how many of you say, I think that that's God, to start praying with my wife at the house, to start praying over my children, to start praying at my house shall be called a house of prayer. So that's very, very, very important. And we've got intercessors that's been faithful for all these years, but let me just tell you, Thank God for their gift that God gave them to intercede for us. But, but we are responsible to pray for our own selves at our own house. We can't just leave all the praying to just those that have a gift. And that Miss Linda and uh, Miss Lois, you guys, y'all are here every week interceding, praying over all those prayer requests to the basket. I'll see them walk in the sanctuary, praying over all your requests. Um, and I thank God that's a gift. And thank God we've had them. Because if they haven't been praying for us all these years, all right, and so it's so important to pray. So I, I just want to encourage you with that. that that's in my heart. And um, there's a movement that's, that's crossing the world, not just here in Baker, but in the world. Prayer, God is calling his church to pray, and we're going to see some phenomenal things happen. I'm, I believe God's going to send revival. All right, so let's jump into the scripture. John chapter 19, verse 26 and 27. We're talking to you about care. Um, God cares for us. Do you agree with that? All right. God meets every need that we have. Do you agree with that? He is faithful. All right. So here's the scripture. We'll jump in it. Jesus is where right now? He, he's on the cross, right? Um, so somebody said he's here. He's here, but 2,000 years ago, approximately, he was on the cross, right? Um, and he died for us. Everybody knows the, um, him being crucified and what that actually means. Jesus is on the cross being crucified, um, he's fixing to die, and he looks down, and he sees his mother and his beloved disciple. Who remembers what his beloved disciple's name was? John, that's exactly right. Um, and this is what he says. Um, you know what? I did, um, I, I thought about a, a key word in our lives when Jesus saw, can we get a closer? Look at that. Man, the camera people, you guys are on it. Um, isn't it good that Jesus can saw? Isn't it good that Jesus sees? Somebody better start running around the building. I, I, you never got so excited over Saul in your life. But let me tell you something. Jesus sees, shout somebody. And because he sees, he cares. And Jesus is on the cross. How many of you know if you was on the cross being crucified, what would you be seeing? What would you be sawing? What would you be thinking? Man, I thought about this. 
Jesus is dying in excruciating pain, been tortured and beat. He looks down, and, and the Bible says that he saw his mother standing there beside the disciple that he loved, John, and he said to her, Dear woman, here is your son. Jesus was still concerned about the needs and, and caring for us and not himself. Shout somebody. He wasn't thinking about himself. He was still thinking about us. Somebody better start running around the building. This, now look, this is not a Baptist church, okay? So if you just get, get like a, a little spirit inspiration, you can, you can just run around the building, all right? And by the way, I love the Baptists. Um, in fact, when we were flying back uh, this week, there was... Um, a foreign nation woman that had her headgear on, whatever you call it, and um, there was um, uh, some people that were there. Zach was right there. There was some some girls that were there, and I heard them start to give the plan of salvation to this woman that was Islamic. And I'm telling you, she um, gave a perfect plan of, of why Jesus Christ came, why he died, paid the price of our sins, and, um, and, and laid out the whole salvation plan of God. And I was just absolutely amazed. So I was so amazed, I, I went up after and actually um, asked her where she was from, and she said that she was from uh, Missouri, and she came from a church that was about 50 people. And, um, and that she was Baptist. And I rejoice for the Baptist. So I'm just telling all the Baptist people, I'm shouting, man. You guys were witnessing. Y'all were on it, man. And um, I got to give my testimony to the woman and talk about how Christ had changed my life. But Jesus, are y'all out there? <clears throat> Jesus saw his mother standing there and, uh, and, and also the disciple and then he turned to his disciple. And let me get the next verse right there, verse 27. And he said to this, uh, this disciple, John, here is your mother. And from then on, this disciple took her into his home. Um, so a couple of things that I got out of this. I got that Jesus cares about us and he sees what we're going through. So much so that he gave instruction on how to take care of his mother and his disciple. I thought about Jesus in his experience because the Bible says that Jesus cannot be touched with our infirmity but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. In other words, Jesus experienced everything that we've experienced in life. And you know who I didn't see there? I didn't see Jesus' daddy. What do you think happened to Jesus' daddy? Jesus says he was dead. How many of you probably think that Joseph would have been at the cross if he was living? How many of you think that Jesus can understand what it is to be in a blended family? Because Joseph was his stepdad. Um, how many of you think that if you've lost loved ones and you're hurting, that Jesus can identify with you? In fact, I believe that that's the reason why he sent his mother with John, the beloved disciple, so that that his mother would be taken care of because she had lost she had lost her husband so what am I saying I'm saying that Jesus is gonna be there for you emotionally shout somebody and then physically alright gotta move the camera how many believe that God's gonna be with you financially I wanna make sure y'all are reading and we're moving um, spiritually and praise God, I believe that. All right, all right, so 
Let me ask you another question. How do you know that God cares? How do you know? Because this is about us. I got to make sure that this, this, this comes to each one of us. This, this is not a mess I'm preaching over here. I'm, I'm preaching to our hearts. Um, so how do you know? Because there's a lot of worldviews out here. Four questions that have to be answered for you to have a godly worldview. The first one is origin. I'll go through the words. Origin, meaning, um, morality, and destiny. Let me say them again. Origin. Got right to because the the question then is is um, origin. Where did you come from? Your worldview has to answer where you came from. Are y'all out there? All right, and I know y'all are thinking on this side. Let me go to this side. Meaning. What is the meaning of life? What's the purpose of life? Okay, represent Jesus. Um, morality. What is really right and what is really wrong? A question was asked. A question was asked. A philosopher of Christianity. Why are you so afraid of subjective morality? Somebody um, give me a camera shot on this right here. Right here. Why are you so afraid of subjective morality? Morality. Somebody said, what is subjective morality? Jeannie said, subjective morality is what is right in your world. In other words, whatever I say right is, is right. What is wrong with that? Let me ask you something. If you really believe that, why do you lock your doors at night? <laughs> I'm giving a time. I want you to think a little bit about this. So I'm slowing way down. So, what if your name is Adolf Hitler? Subjective morality. I... I he believes it's all right. Yeah, he says, um, um, if you're not German and you're a Jew, then we can murder you. How many of you say that ain't right? You, you know why it's not right? Because God says, thou shall not kill. So uh, you got to have absolute truth. Shout somebody. Hey, listen. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not lie, thou shalt not hang out with your neighbor's wife. Adultery. These are laws not to put you in bondage, but to protect us and cover us. These are good things. I'm not trying to take away from you. I'm trying to give you something. Come on now. I'm trying to cover you and protect you. But this is truth. This is absolute truth. That's why we've got to be so careful with the social media today. You know why? Because internet and social media is giving every Joe a platform to be able to say what they want to say. But the problem with it is, is when... When it's subjective morality, it's what your opinion is, it's what you believe it is. Now we got a problem. Now I need to lock my door for sure. Because I don't know if your name's Adolf Hitler or not. I don't know what you're capable of. I don't know what you believe. How I many of you know that absolute truth comes from God? Shout somebody. And that it comes from the Word of God, the Bible. So, here's the first question that has to be answered concerning Christianity and your worldview. 
The first question is, is origin. We, uh, origin simply says where you came from. And I keep thinking about Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Verse 3 says that you're blessed with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How many know you're already blessed? Verse 4 says he chose you in him before the foundation of the world. You want to know what Christianity says, your origin and where you came from? You came out of God. Shout somebody. God had you in him. It's the same as when he breathed in the nostrils of some dirt that he called Adam later. Shout somebody. And Adam became a living soul because God took Adam out of himself and put Adam in some dirt that he formed and Adam became a you. <laughs> Christianity answers the origin. Listen, how about evolution? You know what we teach our kids today? That you came from time, matter, and chance. Oh, I can't wait to become that. We teach our kids, I was once a tadpole swimming in the sea. Then I became a frog with my tail tucked beneath me. Then I became a Japanese in a banana tree. And now I'm a professor. With a PhD. <laughs> you know what PhD stands for? And please, I believe you got to have all education. So I'm not against education. You got to have education. Post hole digger. Uh, that's, that's what. <laughs> I got a PhD too. I'm a good post hole digger. Are y'all alive? All right. So. Your worldview has got to honestly answer four questions. The next word that it has to answer is meaning. Meaning, and I got them written down here, is why, why are you here? Um... Jeff says Acts 1 3. Acts 1 3. Okay. So, um, so why are you here? What is your purpose? How many of you, before you met Jesus Christ, were searching this world for fulfillment, for satisfaction, for purpose? How I many of you know that purpose will help you? God's purpose in your life will give you a reason to live. Listen, you know when you get in trouble with the devil is when you don't care anymore. When you, when you don't have any purpose in your life. You don't know w w what you're doing. You don't know where you're going. Man, there was a time in my life that I came, came in that I didn't know what to do with myself. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what what to do in my life and thank God I made Jesus Christ Lord and Savior of my life and when I made him uh, Lord of my life my heart got fulfilled I got satisfied in my life that I finally found the purpose for which I was created I was I was uh, purpose to come back to God I was taken out of God in my origin and I was put in a place called planet earth and now God's meaning and purpose is for me to live for him and love him and serve him uh, now all of a sudden now that I have God in my life the void in my heart is satisfied I don't have to I don't have to go chase drugs and I don't have to go chase things that have of this world that have no answers. The reason why I did drugs is because is I was looking for the answer of life. I was looking for a purpose. I was looking for a meaning in life. I didn't know what to do. Because let me tell you something. When you don't have God and you're not doing God's will who created you, and you're not following the owner's manual, then you're out of place. You lost. 
That's why we say I was once lost and now I'm. I was once blind, but now I, I was once dead and now I'm alive. That's what that means is now I found meaning of life. I've, listen, Christianity answers the meaning question in your life. The next question is morality. What is right and wrong? What is good and evil? Shout somebody. Christianity answers that question. It says, you don't fool with your neighbor's wife. Just make sure when you talk, you tell the truth. And you never, ever take what gift God gave someone called life. You don't have the right. You didn't give it. You don't have the right to take it. Only God has the right because he's God. By the way, he knows everything. The next thing is destiny. Where will you spend your eternity? Where will you, what's after death? What comes after death? How many of you know Christianity answers that question? How many of y'all glad you're Christians? Come on now. We call this Christian. Listen, this is a godly worldview. Christianity answers the questions of a worldview that's of God. You know why I'm a Christian? Because the questions are answered. I don't have to worry about where I came from. I don't have to worry about the meaning of life or the morality of life or my destiny because Christianity, giving my life to God in Christ Jesus has answered all four of those questions and now it's qualified to be a godly, worldly view. Shout somebody. That's why we're Christians. Now, no, you're not going to get offended if I talk about atheists. And we used to have an atheist. I may bring um, Brother Jamie up in a little while. Um, and I'll do my best, Brother Jamie. And I, if look, I get up here and I give you all I got, okay? So that's all I can give you is what I got. Um, so atheists. There's no such thing as an atheist. It's scientifically and mathematically impossible to be an atheist. Somebody said, what in the heck? Why is that? Because in order to be a real atheist, you would have to have all knowledge of all things. You can't tell me that there is no God unless you know everything. Could you imagine what kind of brain you would have if you knew every bit of knowledge that there was, all the languages, all the mathematics? Not only can you add and subtract and know all of that, but you got trigonometry under control. You can do fractions. Jeannie just shook her head. All right, did I lose y'all? <laughs> because if you tell me that you don't know everything in the world and yet you're telling me that God, that, that there is no God, then I'm telling you that there's no way. I, I tell you what, let me see if I can give an illustration. If you tell me that there's no baker in Louisiana, I would ask you, how would you know that there's no baker? Have you done all the research in Louisiana to tell me that you know that there's no baker in Louisiana? Have you researched that? Because I'm going to tell you straight up, 
there is a baker in Louisiana. And you know why I know it? Because I live in Baker. So I'm telling you right now, there is a baker, and I don't care what you tell me, I'm telling you there is a, a, a baker in Louisiana because I experience baker. I live here. Um, let's change it up. What if you told me, by the way, I'm entitled to what I believe. What if you told me that, um, let's change Baker to Zachary. What if you told me that there was no Zachary Sinclair in the world? And I would tell you, yes, there is a Zachary Sinclair in the world. You know how I know that? Because I know the man, Zachary Sinclair. Uh, I'm a friend of his. In fact, I'm his daddy. So you can't tell me that there is no Zachary Sinclair in the world just because you don't know him and that you don't believe that there's a Zachary Sinclair. I'm telling you now, I have an experience. There is a Zachary Sinclair in the world, and I don't care what you say. You may flip the script on me and tell me, all right, well, you say that there is a God, but you told me that I couldn't tell you that there's not a God because I didn't have all knowledge. So, you don't have all knowledge either. And you're telling me there is a God. You're telling me there is a baker. You're telling me there is a Zachary. I don't have to have all knowledge to know that there is a God or to know that there's a baker or to know there's a Zachary. You know why? Because all I needed to know was Zachary. All I needed to know was Baker. All I needed to know was God. I didn't have to have all the knowledge in the world. Shout somebody! I experienced God. God lives in my heart. God changed. Listen, I know that God cares and I know that God lives because I know Him. He's my friend. He's my God. Are y'all out there? Somebody better shout in this place. I was trying to give you my best explanation for atheists. There's another word called agnostic. You know what, I, what an agnostic is? Someone that doesn't believe that God exists. They don't say that, that it's not true. They just don't know. If it's true. How I many of you know it's, it's, it's good that they're agnostic? At least they're saying, I just don't know. I haven't experienced him. Therefore, I don't know him. I'm not saying he doesn't exist. I'm just telling you, I don't know. How I many of you know there's hope for those folks? Come on now. Praise the Lord. All right, so where am I? No. I know there is God. there is a God who cares and I know him so now what I want to do is is I want to I want to hear from some of you brother Jamie come on up here are y'all alive all right you were an atheist yes sir so <clears throat> I want to read some scriptures so you said scientifically mathematically we're also scripturally um, there's proof that no one is born atheist. Come on. Um, in his or her life, he's, he, they have to be taught that there isn't a God or they make a decision for themselves that there isn't a God. And so th this is a scripture. Uh, Romans chapter 1, verse 16. <clears throat> on down a few ways. But it says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also the Greek. Therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith that is written, 
the just shall live by faith. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Because, this is it, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. So, so, there, so there is no, no one ever born that does not believe because the Bible says that God has put it into every man of a knowledge of himself. <clears throat> that is why he goes on to say further in Romans, uh, everyone chooses to serve something. Where the Indians, you know, they chose to serve the creation instead of the creator. You know, and, and, and men choose to serve, to worship themselves instead of their creator. You know, and, and the Bible says that, that um, the fool hath said in his heart that there is no God. And for my life, you know, because of the circumstances in my life, I made a decision that, that there just can't be a God. And, and through God's mercy and through his grace, he revealed himself to me. And, and I realized that, that I wasn't just a fool for not believing. I was being fooled by Satan for not, to not believe. And, you know, not only did I didn't believe in God, but I didn't believe in Satan either. He had me totally deceived. And, but, but, you know, my prayer for, you know, I think every prayer I ever pray for anybody is that, that God will reveal himself to them. You know, because we can preach the word and the word can break through. You know, some plants, some water, signs, wonder, miracles, all that have men like, you know, scratching their head. But when, when Jesus Christ reveals himself in his holiness, in his righteousness, in his love, in his purity, then, then no, every man is without excuse. And so. So, all right, let me ask you a couple pointed questions. You keep it on. When you declare that I'm atheist, God doesn't exist, were you mad at God? Did you have bitterness in your heart? Because that had to come from a root. Yes, sir. So, you know, I like to say that um, I was an evangelist for atheism because I just, I hated God, man. I really Why did. Why did you hate him? Because what, what did God do to you that made you mad at him? God particularly didn't do nothing to me. It was just a circumstance of my life, you know. Oh, uh, you were mad that you thought you should be at another place in life in some kind of way you wasn't what? there. No, and no. if God really was there, then he would have gotten me there. Yes, I guess, kind of. It was just, I was just a kid, and I was just a kid, and... You know, the circumstances of what happened to me, I had no control over. I lived, I say it all the time, I lived in a little bitty country town that's a four mile square. And that was my world. And, and you know, it didn't have internet. We didn't really, you know, the cable reached to Alexandria, which was, you know, 40 miles, 30, 40 miles away. And that's all I knew. And, and, and so I was, I was raised Catholic, I guess you can call it. Never really went to church. But, and, but just the circumstances of my life, I just, at a young age, I, just, I remember crying out to God and nothing changing with my circumstances. And, and so I just became bitter and hard at a very young age. And I remember my grandmother lived right next door to a Pentecostal uh, church. And I would stand at the fence and I would just, I don't ever remember what I said to them, but I, I, I see them right now, uh, you know, grownups turning towards me, the Pentecostal grownups turning towards me and just like rebuking me. You know, and, and but I can't. I, mean, I was just so bitter and just so mad at God. I, and you're just like ten years old, nine, ten years old. And I just said, you know, you know, I don't want to say a cuss word, but I just said, what? You know, you, know, you didn't. Whatever. Not, not you know? that bomb. You did and not so, drop that bomb. And so, and, and just my heart became. You know, it says there in Romans, your heart becomes harder and harder and harder. And I just, I just, you know, I persecuted. Um, God's children, not like physically. Like people like me? Yes, sir. You know, one guy specifically, um, and I hope he can see this, um, his name was Paul, and I worked with him. That's how we know God lives. God's real. So I worked with Paul in the oil field, and, um, and you know, he, we, we, it was four men into a room, and we bunked together. And Paul would leave scriptures on my bed and I would leave pornography on his bed and and I would just write man just demonic stuff down upside down stars you know 666 just 
you know, I hate God. And it was weird. It's like I had this Satan actually gave me a like a poetic type of thing. And I would just write these poems about, you know, God not being real and stuff like that. And, and I would leave that on his bed. And one day he told me, he said, you know what you are? He said, you are a demon trying to take me to hell. And I looked at him in his face and I said, yeah, that's what I am. And and my nickname was was Manson. Everybody in the in oil field has a nickname. And my nickname was Manson, after Charles Manson. And that's because I was twisted and I just, man, I was just messed up. And and just, you know, the roots of it was I hated God, you know. And I really allowed Satan to, to take that hatred and to saying there was no God, you know. And um, so that was it. I lived my life till I was 26 years old like that. Donna Honeycutt says to us online right here, she says, um, God has been so good to me. How I many of y'all believe that yeah. right there? I lost my daughter three months later, probably something she walked through. After losing her son, she lost her daughter three months later. And God never let me go. And I never let him go. He knows what I need more than I know. I trusted him then, and I continue to trust him today. And we've got a number of people that have lost their children in here. And I just want all of you to know that I love you so very much. And, and Jesus can identify with those wounds and those hurts because he's had great loss uh, in his life as well. Um, so, um, Ashley, come up. Come up for a second. Yeah. Your daughter waves at you. Bye. And here you come. Why do you know that God cares about you and that you know he exists? Why, why did you make, why, why do you have God in your life today? Oh, wow. <laughs> what kind of life do you come from? Okay, well, um, your family? I would definitely say, you want me to give it a, an aspect from here looking back? Shoot, yeah. I can definitely say he was always there. You know, he since I was very little, he always was there. But I was tormented from a little bitty girl seeing evil spirits my whole life. Um, my daddy was schizophrenic, and he would see, and I would see what he would see. So that's just kind of how I grew up in uh, molestation, uh, that kind of thing. But the, the devil was, um, I always saw him in my life. And so whenever I, I began to, you know, know the Christian life, whenever I was 27, that's when I got born again. I just realized he was 26. But anyway, I was 27 when I got born again. And whenever at salvation for me, it was a very drastic change. And I, I, I saw the Lord breaking chains off of me. And he just spoke to me that he was going to take everything and that he was in control of everything. And at that point, I forgave my parents. I mean, there was just so much. He, I was one of those people that whenever I was born again, I was born again. He just changed me. I was, uh, you know, this way, and then I was this way. I was evil. I always saw evil. And so in my walk with him as a Christian, I had to learn how to not fear. And that's what he taught me was fear was false evidence appearing real. And that um, everything I had been tormented by my whole life and my daddy was just uh was was evil and it was of the enemy and so now um i can say like my daughter she sees the lord and so i can just say that the lord just he reverses everything now i can look at somebody and i can know if they um you know or being tormented or things like that so everything that i suffered as a child he has just brought it for so his do, kingdom do really you use the discernment that you have today to help other people definitely i go in the prisons and i can see people that are ate up and it might take a month or two months or three months but i just you know i stand there in the faith of the lord and just uh walk it out into the lord just kind of releases that um so let me salvation ask. for them so um so do you have a ministry what tell us a little bit about your ministry and we're coming to a close today so y'all are y'all are on the streets um and and y'all are taking your experiences in other words you came to the altar you came to the lord and now you've gone back out and what are you doing in the going back out 
Because a lot of people know what they were saved from, but what are you saved for? You know what you came from. You know where you came from. But now what are you saved for? How many of you believe that you got a purpose? That God has meaning for your life. He's got a plan for your life. And, and it's not just enough for us to come from. Thank God we celebrate our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But that ain't just what it's about. Now God's called me to, to go back out. And I want to hear from where God took you from. And now what are you doing? Honestly, for me, is I have a new perspective for people to, um, like, you know, I'll see somebody on the streets or somebody that is tormented, and I have a compassion to understand that they're just bound and that the Lord can set them free. And, yeah, we like to see the manifest presence of the Lord, but sometimes it's just in His timing, and so it's a process. But He just gives us the grace to watch somebody um, and to pray for him quietly in your closet. Where are y'all going today? We go to, we go to Sherwood Forest. So after this so, service, right? Today, every Sunday, every Sunday, you go to Sherwood Forest. But there's specific Wait, people. Does this we church see. give y'all food and stuff? Definitely. How much food do we give? We, we have too much food. <laughs> All right. Do y'all have enough rum for the food that Miracle Place right. Church gives y'all every every Sunday? But we can honestly say that every single person that we stop and talk to at this point is uh, the, the Lord is already moving in their life. He's already speaking to them in the midst of a heroin addiction, in the midst of prostitution. And that all we're doing is being an outward sign saying that, yes, what you're hearing is true. Because sometimes people are uh, think they're crazy or whatever to think that the Lord is really speaking to them or revealing himself to them. So we're just an outward presence that's always there saying so that he's So a he's governor there. Holy Spirit is working on all the hearts of Already. all the people Everybody's in speaking planet Jesus Earth. On the streets. No matter yeah. what nation, no matter what lie the devil through the power he's, of suggestion suggests yeah. to you that the Holy Ghost governor, he's the governor of heaven, uh, governor of earth representing heaven. Mm -hmm. And he is working in every heart of every human being right now, right to say. In fact, Governor Holy Spirit is speaking to you right now, and I want to ask you right now, what is Governor Holy Spirit saying to you today? Because that's what it's all about. It's, it's, it's about what God is saying to you. And I hope that we just confirm. I hope all of us will always be able to hear God and confirm the voice of God in your heart so that you can submit your will and your life to Him. Come on, Jamie. So, you know, I just want to say this. The call, the purpose and calling on God on our lives isn't always standing in the pulpit for everybody or going to the streets for everybody. You know, Paul... Uh, the guy who was just witness to me and just and his ministry to me was I, I got born again the Lord showed me him on his knees <sighs> Paul messed me up praying for me you know and, and, and but he didn't have a ministry you know he didn't have a title of, of the fivefold and but he was just a faithful son a faithful witness you know and and, and I said I was evangelist for atheism now I'm evangelist for Christ. You know, it's just it's just in me, you know, and, and it's just and it's caring, you know, that's what has changed in me towards humanity was caring. Because not only did I hate God, I really hated people in my life also. You know, and but now I can look at a a person who is who is lost and and desperate and I can care for them. You know. So when somebody lashes out at you Is it sometimes something else in them and it really has nothing to do with you and they're just lashing out because of what's in them? Yes, yeah, so well, I say Come more on. people lash out at her than they do at me. And, and she just has people manifest on her in the grocery stores and stuff. And, and so, yes, I think it is. In the grocery stores? In the grocery stores. Please and tell. So, no. <laughs> 
real quick. I had my mask below my nose. That's all I'm gonna say. Oh, all right, okay. <laughs> no, I'm not. No, I'm not talking about that. All right, we, let's. We. Uh, how many of y'all ready to go home and ready to get something to eat and ready to do something different? And um, I just, I want everybody to know too before we pray that I respect your time and I respect you coming to church. And I know that you could go anywhere else. You could do. You could go fishing if you wanted to, but you choose to come to church with me. And I just want to say thank you, okay? Because I love being with you on Sundays, and I speak God's blessing upon you. So God, thank you so much today. Please, Holy Spirit, continue to lead us, continue to guide us, continue to show us your will and your purpose for our lives. And Lord, we just want to say thank you so much for everything you do. Hey, if you've not made Jesus Lord of your life, this is a great opportunity. Let's all pray together. Just say, Lord, I ask you to forgive me. I ask you, Lord, to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior in the name of Jesus. Come on, give the Lord a great big shout. Hey, I speak God's blessing upon you. Have a great, great day. We love all of you. Give somebody a fist bump or something or a look. Give Brother Ray a look over there and uh, love on somebody.